the discussion thinking about technology and carry you through the rest of the chocolate making process. So I feel like in some ways these two lectures are an extended version of how it's made, but, <laughs> but with some anthropology thrown in. <laughs> Especially, you know, I'm thinking about it as an archaeologist, but there, um, I was really struck by the cooking technology uh, reading for today because it was a really, even though it's, it's a fairly short chapter, but really beautiful um, thoughts about what these uh, objects, how they're, they're, they're using the technology, the aesthetics of it, all those sorts of issues. So we'll talk about that a little bit um, as the class goes along. And so last time, just a brief recap. What were the stages? Let me ask you. What were the stages that we went through? Harvest. Harvesting, yeah. So what are parts of that? Let's break it down more. What do you the tree. Yeah, without cutting the tree, right? <laughs> and you, you get the pods, you sort the pods, break them open, which is no, you know, it's not plucking the luscious fruit gently from, you know. <laughs> um, the beans are this kind of slimy white stuff. <laughs> Take that, put it into what has to happen next? Yeah, in the crates. What happens in the crates? Fermentation. Yeah. And so you have all these issues about how much air is introduced, how ma maintaining the heat for a certain amount of time, um, a lot of tinkering in that whole process. And you saw a few different examples in the videos of the technology people use in different places. So it's not super standardized. Um, and you'll see that today, too. Even with, I didn't put in, in any footage of big industrial machines because we'll get more of that later on. Um, and I, I wanted to sort of still think about higher tech, lower tech, and really improvised systems um, that is kind of common for, for cacao and chocolate um, work today. Um, fermentation, and then what happens after fermentation? Okay, so we're to that point. So what happens next? Um, roasting. How many people here love Starbucks coffee? Starbucks? Starbucks, huh? Like just Starbucks? Yeah, just like Starbucks, you know, for people who really like it, how do you compare it to other coffee that you have? What's the biggest difference? don't like Starbucks. Why not? Really bitter. Really? Bitter? Huh? And bitter, strong. I've had uh, some people, and this isn't to just rag on <coughs> Starbucks, but it, they're a good example because it's a, it's a very particular taste that they've developed. And so, so some people call them Charbucks. Because <laughs> um, it's just, I mean, they roast their coffee. <laughs> And it does, it brings out particular flavors. And that's equally true. This is, it, again, you're thinking um, um, in terms of these seeds and roasting them. And even, you can think of, have, have any of you tried roasting uh, pumpkin seeds at home? You know? And sometimes it goes well, and sometimes not so well. <laughs> um, so this, um, I've, you know. So there are all those issues about what temperature to roast it at, how long to roast it, all affect the cacao. Um, and these other factors, too, that I listed up here um, are, again, remember with the fermentation, there's a lot of environmental factors and, and where that fermentation um, container is. Is it outside? Is it inside? You know, what is it made of? That sort of thing all affect. And again, you're dealing with temperature here in a different way. 
Um, so fermentation is a chemically induced um, increase in temperature because of the fermentation process. Here, you're applying heat to it. Um, so yeah, the size of the beans, which the ones that I brought to class have been fairly similar in size, but the, it does vary quite a bit. You have pretty small ones that look almost the size of a, a coffee, whole coffee bean, um, versus the fairly big ones that we have, and even a little bit bigger than that. And then again, it's that issue of the flavor that you want out of it. Do you want that kind of, uh, I'm trying to think of a nice way to put it, um, um, strong, fully cooked, um, almost smoky taste. Let's look at a couple of examples. And I'll show you the commercial one first. Oh, yeah, here we go. See, this time I need to look. Ask me later. Let's do this. And so here you see the cacao going into something that's uh, a machine that's turning it. So, uh, I'm really inspired by that book chapter. You can think about sound. What's that sound? What does that environment make you think of? What is the it? Rainforest. Huh? It makes you think of the rainforest? Like it sounds like one of those like sorry, sorry. Oh my god. I think we're going to have to slap the or something here. Um, no. Um. <laughs> they sound like rain. It did like, from the beans going in there. Yeah. But there's also that grinding metallic sound of the motor. The factory. Yeah. Like yeah, exactly. And these, so this is, and that's actually a fairly small roaster in Guatemala. So um, this is smaller scale, something that could be done on a kind of a craft level. But um, compare it to. Um, remember, this is part of your vocabulary. This vocabulary will not go away. And especially, you, you saw it a lot again today um, with the metate versus the comal and the kind of significance of that. I love this. This is Maria Axe's house, and now we're roasting cocoa beans. And um, Maria roasts these for about two hours, she said. Yes. And then she peels them, and then she grinds them. And as you can hear, we're listening to a religious program here from Toledo, Ohio, Harvest Radio. Here's the radio. It's one of the neighborhood chickens. Really typical Maya house. This is in Belize. This is the village of San Miguel, near Punta Gorda. One of the Mayan villages in Belize. Smells good. Yeah. Or the idea of like how it's formed. Well, all of that. It, it's so. Great question. Um, so that was built yeah. by her or her family. Um, typically, probably, uh, they build them themselves, and then, and so, um, if we go back, let me see if I can, it's just like my territory. <coughs> yeah, uh, no, wait, wait uh, come on, we get out of this, why can't I go back to the one, support us, no. Um, so I think it's worth sharing. Uh, here we go. This okay, is Maria me... Axe's house, and now we're roasting. Screen, so we can look at this. So, what do you see? This? How do you? What do you? What do you? See, what can you tell that it's made out of the different parts of the house? What do you like? Um, the roof is probably a thatch roof, and that may seem like, oh, you know, how so primitive. These aren't. It's a great question about technology and improvements, and that's part of what the book chapter today was sort of questioning. Um, when, when is it 
just the appearance of modernity, like having industrially made uh, roof tiles and that sort of thing, that's the sign of progress um, in cinder block versus what actually works well. Uh, a lot of you haven't been to the tropics. You want to stay cool. You want the air to move. And so things like this gap between the boards is not a sign of poverty. It's engineering to make it a comfortable space. Now, what is another solution? Well, you build the wall solid. Um, it would be hot as blazes unless you have an air conditioner, but then you have an air conditioner, which means you have to have electricity, you know? <laughs> So what, what are, you know, you can think about issues of sustainability, um, long-term practices, long-term impact on the environment. I mean, that's, that's what we're questioning as anthropologists. There's not one absolutely right solution for every situation. There are lots of different solutions, and it's the choices that people make and the, the, the kind of benefits and the downside of different things. So um, this also, that the hearth, it's a three stone hearth, but it's kind of made into an oven-y kind of thing. Um, and the book chapter today talked about these um, in-between oven sorts of things. Uh, Lorena, they called it, really, like a great, um, and I think that's actually probably a fairly close example to what a Lorena would be like. Downside of it is that you can cook a few things all at the same time, but fires in the house. It's more, it, t it tends to catch stuff on fire more um, than the traditional freestone one. So, um, that, no, that looks like a comal. It or looks like a regular, it is, it is ceramic. yeah, it looks ceramic to me. And the sound of it, again, you know, if you use all your senses and you think about that, um, it's not got that metallic sound. What do you see in our house that is industrially made? <coughs> locations? Huh? Would it be location? Yeah, you see some packaging, definitely. Um, plastic containers. And these dishes are industrially made. I mean, probably not all of them. There may be some local, locally made stuff like the Kamals um, that are not coming out of big factories. But, but yeah, you definitely see some plastic in here, too. And then the radio, right? <laughs> She's listening to the radio. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and how long <coughs> does she roast those? Two hours. Two hours. Doing that. Right? Whereas the other thing, you dump it in, you let it do this turning and heating and Whoever's manning that needs to, to be around, but it's not quite the same constant attention that this involves. So you can think about people's, uh, the tempo of people's lives and, and the sort of expectations. And also this is smaller scale, right? This is less than, that other thing that we were looking at is probably about this big around and that deep, the, the little roaster. Um, so maybe, a good 10 times the amount. But then she's doing this for her to feed her house, her household. The other people are doing it to make chocolate bars to sell internationally. Any other questions? Yeah. You said toko, is that right? Or is it supposed to be like, when we say hot cocoa, should it be like hot cacao? No, not for hot cacao, not for hot cocoa, like the powdered stuff. Yeah. Cocoa's fine. I know it's like some chocolate bar says like like 70% cocoa and then some say cacao, and I was like, what's the difference? I will, you know, I think I almost have to have a whole separate lecture just on the language of, of cacao and chocolate. So like, it's when he said cocoa, he's referring to... Like he's referring to the, the yeah. cacao bean. Yeah. So cocoa is something different? Like Depends on who you read, you know? It, and it drives me nuts, in fact, because some people will be really adamant. 
well, cocoa means this, cacao means this, and chocolate means this. And then you read somebody else and they're really adamant. That <laughs> and they're all, so uh, I was looking at one, the, I think it's on the Equal Exchange website, and they say, well, we use cocoa to mean the roasted bean. Other people will designate cocoa um, for cacao that's been processed even more. Now, what's tech always correct in my mind is that this is cacao that then gets processed in other ways. And cocoa is just one of those uh, words that creeps in in the colonial period. Uh, I'd have to look and see when the earliest occurrence of it is, but it really comes in comes to the fore. It's British writers. Like they, they just scramble stuff and and then and you'll have some documents that have both cacao and cocoa in it and they're talking about the same thing. And so it's not clear at all when the word I mean when the fir word first comes out it's just like the random to my mind, the random spelling of things. And it's true of lots of other place names, other kinds of words. It wasn't just special to cacao. And because it, it was a funny word, it was just. Sort of, yeah. Oh, this is right. But it says cocoa powder is raw cacao that's been roasted at high temperatures. Like raw cacao powder is made by cold pressing on roasted cocoa beans. Um, yeah, well, that's just they're defining it for yeah. you. And so, uh, so I think there's such variable terminology that each each time they have to define uh, what they're meaning. And, and some people try to define it, but nobody exactly follows the same meaning. Um, I'm trying to think of a parallel, but I don't have a hard and fast um, definition for cocoa other than you really shouldn't call hot, you know, the Swiss Miss powder cacao, because it's got very little of it in there. <laughs> that definitely you can call cocoa, because Cocoa implies some degree of processing from the 19th century on. Let me put it that way. What that processing is, is variable, but depending on who's talking about it. Sorry, I can't give you a I could be adamant. I could be adamant myself. No, all these other people are wrong. <laughs> this is what cocoa means. <laughs> I know that, and then the other thing you, you, you should be familiar with by this point is cacao is an ancient, ancient word. And cacao referred to this stuff in the, plant, in the tree. So, um, the fiddling that people did with that word later on um, has different sorts of meanings. Anything else? It's fun. Um, okay. So, in the the beans that I brought to class, you know, uh, you roast it. So you can see there too that she's roasting the the whole beans, and in the machine also the whole beans. Um, those things are pretty durable. Once they're dry, you can you can kind of do a fair bit with them, move them around and stuff, and and they won't fall apart. So you actually have to kind of crunch them and then get the shell out of there because I think a couple of you got a piece of shell in your mouth. It's like, ah, oh, this isn't so <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> um, um, and remember the shell, for some people, they make uh, teas or, or kinds of brews out of those. Um, and in fact, there's a, a uh, uh, Aeronaut Brewery in Boston is making uh, a beer, I believe, with cacao shell as part in there with the hops and kind of give a chocolate because it still gives an interesting flavor to it. Um, more nutty. nutty. Um, so you got to crunch it to get because what you want are the nibs <coughs> out, and and that means you got to separate the shell from the nibs somehow. Now you saw at least how the shell broke up. What are the, the, the sort of issues in getting the nib apart from the, the shell? 
It's not like when you're breaking open the pod and pulling out the seeds, right? That's, that's fairly easy. It'll all come out as a mass. You can toss the fruit over to the side. Yeah, similar in color. So what's the biggest difference? Well, the shell is light and thin, and the nib is fairly dense and heavy. And so that means you can do some fairly simple Separate them. Oh, see, you weren't here last time. Um, and I didn't bring any. So you, you'll you'll get to see some here in a minute, but it's okay. it's a little bit inside that <laughs> it looks like you know. Uh, how would you describe it? It's the actual like chocolate part. Of yeah. The cacao. Yeah. Oh. So it's oh, like a little I interior know. part of the seed that's heavy and and uh, sort of irregularly shaped, um, yeah. So the, the, what I'm going to give you all to sample today has some nib embedded in the chocolate liquor. Um, so you'll get to see it, but it's not quite. I'll bring some some next time. Okay. Okay. So and then. As I mentioned last time, you know, it's around 53, 55%. There's, that nib is made up of cocoa butter. Um, so it's a fat that's in there. Seeds are like that, right? Corn is a seed. We, we use corn oil. Um, I'm trying to think of some other really oily grains. Yeah, sunflower seeds, absolutely. So you get, you, so there are some that are, are really um, like rich in that sense. Um, here I'll show a winner work. I saw, I, I tried really hard. Manoa chocolate in Hawaii um, had this great video that they had this winner work that was bike powered. Like the people rode the bike and it shook this thing and the stuff came. <laughs> <laughs> it was really cool, but I couldn't find it on YouTube. Um, but this is a good one. This is a it's an industrial machine. Large volume. sort of vibration involved, it'll sort of shake it. Um, what you'll see, like a home method, is just in a colander shaking. Um, and because the thing is, at a certain point, you know, especially little bitty bitty pieces, you, you don't want to sit, you can't pick them out, it would take forever. And so there has to be some sort of air movement that'll help lift that off. Um, and let the larger things fall below. Um, so another technological <coughs> issue. Now, assuming that you've got your um, winnowed nibs, pretty pure um, your stuff. Um, the next thing is this 
grinding it. Um, because that is where, for any of it, to consume any of the rest of it is, it's got to go through, it's got to be ground one way or the other. Because um, I'm thinking in foods and um, in drinks and all that sort of thing. Now, the chapter for today about the Chorti Maya, they pay a lot of t attention to texture and the effect of different sorts of technologies and grinding things. And they're really, like for corn grinding, they're very picky about texture. And that to make a good tortilla, it can't be too lumpy. It's like, gross. We did a bad job with this. <laughs> and, um, you want it fine and even. So, and I think, I would not be at all surprised if that sort of pickiness is also quite true for grinding cacao, that you want that. Um, so the kind of home technology would be the manos and metates, the, the hand grinding, and you'll see an example here in a second. Um, the electric corn, and the hand corn grinders that they introduce as part of the modernization, um, of the Maya kitchen in the 70s and the 80s that really didn't work very well. Um, it, it didn't grind it evenly. Like it, it didn't grind it fine enough. And so it made, made for bad tortilla. Um, now, part of, here's where the terminology gets a little weird. Because chocolate liquor isn't liquid. It's just pure pure cacao ground up um, into a kind of paste. Um, and you can either use it, that ground cacao nib, as it is. Well, usually there's another step of processing. Um, I'm sort of sidestepping the issue of extracting cocoa butter at the moment because, again, that's this. It's a funny thing. Um, it, when you look at examples of like, great moments of progress in the technology of chocolate, if you look at it from, um, say, a Hershey's or a Cadbury side, oh, it's when we developed the electric press to separate the cocoa butter out. And that had never been done, but you know, the, the story is this heroic story of, of um, advancing technology and big machines and being able to process a lot of stuff. Um, cocoa butter can be extracted by less, um, by simpler means, uh, but I, I, I want to look at that in particular and looking at the narrative about um, industrial chocolate separately. Um, so, there's, and really, the other thing about this issue of fineness and mouthfeel and grinding, it's like it starts and it doesn't stop for a while. So you have an initial grind and then you make your decisions about what you're going to do with it from there. Um, whether you're going to extract a certain amount of the cocoa butter or not. And then are you going to add some cocoa butter in at a certain point or not? And then are you going to add in uh, flavoring? Of other sorts of inclusions or not. Um, so the hydraulic press, we'll talk about a little bit later. I'm going to show you an example of an electric grinder and then one with um, This one. This one's a great one. 
This is the guy. another, it's the same kind of thing. Okay. Um, so what, what are some, um, what are some things that you th think might happen if you're using that kind of mono imitate versus the industrial sort of mechanical stuff. Right? distribution of cocoa butter and cacao, you know, mixed really nicely. So it could be, I mean, you could have that as a question. Is, is are you going to end up with something that's less well mixed because of it? Um, what, what else do you think? It's another factor that might come into It's going to be consistent in every batch, but it's probably going to be a little bit different depending on who grinds it with the top end. Yeah, uh huh, right, right. Do you have the shells on those? Yeah, it looked like it was. Um, let's go back. Just the circle with it. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that one, it's not separated. Yeah, so you're gonna have you're gonna have some shell in there. <laughs> Shells being ground up with a nib. Also, you can think of the stone itself. And so some stones are really, really hard. And like in the chapter for today, um, the, the Maya woman talked about, well, this, this is a newer mono, or this is a newer metate that's sharp. That one's really smooth and old and almost worn out. Um, God, and oh. The other thing I want to impress upon you while we have that, let's go back. Let me stop it here. See how big these are, the mentantes? Um, a lot of times they're they're shaped like this one is just more like a, a boulder that they probably very roughly shaped. Sometimes they're very formally shaped. Sometimes beautiful sort of um, like a, it looks like a sculpture. Um, there's something. Central America, Costa Rica especially, that have these long legs and elaborate, you know, designs on them. Think. How much do you think that weighs? This is like, I can tell you, just, the you know, I don't know how deep it is. The baton itself is going to be... Oh, you mean the whole, the whole boulder? Yeah. yeah, it's hard to say. I can tell you it's got to be a good like 70, 80 pounds easily. There's some that um, in my archaeological survey I found half a metate and those are, you know, 40, 50 pounds. And I'm like, guys, load it up. <laughs> you know, we're collecting that. No. <laughs> And, and really, and this is a little one of those quirks of archaeological preservation with monos and metates, because they're never 
enough metates for the number of people you know lived in that community, that archaeological community. There just never, there just aren't enough of them. Um, and I think part of it is this thing of so long as it works, we take it with us. And that's illustrated in that chapter where she pays the young guy or asks the young guy to carry the metate to her new house. They don't leave those behind. It's, this is not disposable. You know, it's permanent in that sense and that you have generations using them. Um, so I think in a lot of cases people just, you know, whatever happens, they move them along. It's very unusual to find a usable metate at, at an archaeological site. Um, you know, these, yeah, these things are quite a few, at least 50 pounds because the little monos are a few pounds. Um, so yeah, I think of the logistics of that. Um, okay, so we grind it. We have the chocolate liquor. I'm debating about when to do this. Now, oops, I spell that. There's another kind of, uh, the next step is another kind of grinding, but it's called conching. And that's where you get really, really, really fine, finely ground cacao. Like the first is like a the, the first draft or something, you know, first episode. Um, and that's really at the stage of the conching is the, the decisions about how much cocoa butter versus how much cacao. Um, and it's with this addition of temperature, you know, heat it up as part of the conching process and aerate it. Now, and this is also where um, one thing when you're judging quality of chocolate, it is that, that feel that it has in your mouth. And, and how would you describe usually what, what chocolate feels like in your mouth versus, say, um, oatmeal? And, and um, pretty soon here, we'll, we'll do some comparisons of different textures so you can get a sense of that. But this is really where this stage is like the crucial stage. And so what happens, um, especially if you want to make a shortcut, this is a long process that, that um, requires a lot of judgment. When, when it's conched enough and conched properly. Um, and you can add stuff that's like a shortcut. So you can add soy lecithin as an emulsifier, and that'll kind of give the idea of that same smoothness. And what does that do instead of waiting, you know, waiting for days for this stuff to conch? So when you visit a um, chocolate factory, especially like a smaller fine chocolate producer, there's a lot of this going on, oh, I'm conscious, so <laughs> we're, you know, I've got to go check on the stuff, you know. It, it, it takes a while and they, they monitor it a lot. Um, but it, it's, this is where that really, really, really thorough mixing happens. Um, and there's a couple of nice videos from this um, small equipment manufacturer named uh, Coco Town. You slowly take the drum and bring it down to the first setting. We open up the latch. This is after all the beans. No, she's not listening. The capacity of the beans of the drum holds up to four to six pounds. So this is for like a, slowly close our a lot of our latch. craft chocolate Place makers. It on the second setting. She's walking you through the whole machine. Close our door. Set our time. So which is 20, set, 20 minutes on rows. So here we're, we're uh, yeah, the roast room. And it's roast. It runs four to six pounds of beans in a batch. 
The roasters are set at a fixed temperature of 135 degrees Celsius. Roasting time varies from 20 to 45 minutes depending on the beans variety, origin, and cocoa butter content. To remove the beans from the drum, I stop the machine, open the door, and open my latch. I'm going to close the door again and then turn the, the roaster back on so that the drum can release the beans.
Now we're going to start our grinding process. We have a couple nibs here, and we're going to add them into the drum. Now, we can grind our cocoa nibs up to 90 hours to make our chocolate liqueur, and then from that point, we'll slowly add our cocoa butter, if you like, and our sugar. Part two. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll watch a little bit of it because uh, she's gonna talk, show the molding. Um. <laughs> so we're gonna start with it's our chocolate mold here. This is a chocolate mold that looks like a cow pod, and we're gonna polish it. Polishing is very important because we're gonna rub the cocoa butter in into the the mold to add a little bit of shine, but also as in polishing the mold with cotton. You know, we're just gonna go one by one and polish a little bit on the edges so that there's nothing left into the into the mold. Also, if there's yeah, any well, it's, it's water drops or um, anything yeah, left over, as, as you see thing. here on the cotton, there's still cocoa, um, cocoa butter inside the mold. The people who do this just into the mold. It's just going to shine. We're just polishing it from them. Which is the one in the chocolate here in Canada who gave me the mm -hmm. chocolate we're going to taste today. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. He's an architect. Huh? Engineer. Oh, so and then she decided she's going to make it. As chocolate. you polish, you, know, you can see oh, some gosh. of the oh, okay. <laughs> residue. <laughs> Even though this has been washed, um, and you don't wash your molds very often, only because you don't want to remove that shine. You want to polish this. Yeah, so that's the issue. This is aesthetics. You know, you can talk about the aesthetics of tortillas, chocolate. but also the aesthetics of chocolate and any of these foods. Process. And with tempering, you need um, granite or marble top. A lot of times it's to start the texture in your mouth, process, what you're used to, you what you expect, and then the way it looks. Because if that cheese doesn't look right, it doesn't matter how great it tastes. Okay. Yeah, she'll put this stuff in the bowl. Is that dark chocolate? 
Yeah, she didn't say what the percent was, like how much sugar she put in versus cacao, but that's what that percentage is when it's 70% or 50% or whatever. It's how much sugar versus cacao. <laughs> temperature in these different, like it's not just grinding at room temperature, it's also adding heat and um, you have to, to cool it, warm it and cool it and warm it and cool it and warm it and cool it to get it to the right texture finally, strangely enough. So you add it, so she cooled it, she's adding it back in. And Is this process ever automated? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it is, and this all has amazing. So yeah, automation really standardizes so the warming and cooling. What, it, what you can do so though, going to as a small to batch candy. producer, is evaluate your progress along the way. This sometimes works a little better if you have a ladle. Make <laughs> 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 sure each candy is filled with chocolate. She will and scrape them. Work fast. She'll get it full and she'll scrape them. Okay. <laughs> we love this Coco Town demonstration. The faster you work, the better off you are. Yes. Yeah, because it's that temperature. I mean, dang, you know, you got it at the right temperature. You got to get it in there so it'll mold and then it'll have that shine to it. all the way across to make sure that each cavity is filled all the way. Okay, we're going to stop as delightful as this is. Um, um, okay, and then you have another process that was part of what she was showing a little bit but didn't talk about explicitly, is this tempering. That's when she puts it on the marble slab, but there's also this decrease in temperature um, that's done slowly and then warm it, cool it, warm it, cool it. That's the tempering. Um, and that really um, gives it the, the final texture. And, if, and it affects the, the flavor. Um, and then finally, you know, she put it in the molds. But then the next step, of course, is to, to package it somehow. Whether you're taking chocolate balls to sell in the market in Haiti, or you're hoping that it ends up on the shelf in Whole Foods, you know, what is it going to look like? That's part of those aesthetics of the food, um, and what sort of expectations does that set? Okay, so I wanted you all to pass this around quickly before I open it and destroy the, the packaging forever, but in this case, <laughs> this is... Uh, Palette de Bean. She is so. She, it's a, a craft chocolate maker in Canada. And if you look at it, you'll see that the molding is this sort of. It looks like wood, a piece of wood or something. You know, I always start on this side. I'm going to start over here. Um, <laughs> but just pass it. Look at it um, quickly, and it, and you'll see on the other side that the um, the cocoa nibs, the cacao nibs that are in there. Um, okay, thinking about the Kit Kat bar in the grocery store, what is it packaged in? Plastic. Plastic, yeah. <laughs> it used to be this foil wrapper and then the paper on the outside. Now they don't even do that. They've gone to this, um, um, what do you call it? Um, yeah, this component this sort of film, plastic film. And again, it's labor-saving, cheaper, um, 
predictable, you know, you just, there's, there's one step that's taken out of it. You know how these are done? And I know a lot of, you know, the chocolate makers who I know, have met, a lot of times it's th them folding it by hand. They, you know, they design the whole thing themselves, they fold it by hand, they put, you know, put it in the thing, put it, and so that's a, it's a lot of um, labor. Now what I have embedded in the um, PowerPoint is this interest, you know, this is more details on why there was that shift in at least industrial chocolate away from the foil and paper. And now that foil and paper is a mark of nicer chocolate. Um, but that's not even like this sort of thing. That, um, but the, the Kraft chocolate makers. It's still a, a version of industrial chocolate. Um, and then you can think about, well, what sort of, what sort of images do you expect on the chocolate packaging? Chocolate Yeah, what's a chocolate image, though, to you? It says the percentage. Yeah, it says a percentage. What does it look, you know? Brown. Brown. How much? Purple. Purple. Yeah. Purple. <laughs> Is it, are, there, are there some colors you expect more than others on the? Yeah. Deep. Deep. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Exactly. Unless it's for like breast cancer awareness or something. Um, you know. And if it is in pink, what would you expect it to be aiming towards? Kids still like it. So you think of um, Halloween candy, Easter candy, that kind of really kid-oriented. So these are all gendered messages being sent out with the packaging in some cases. Um, things about, you know, what social group are you aiming at in the packaging? What do you rarely have a sense of in a lot of the packaging? Sometimes where it came from, that's becoming a little bit more, uh, more transparent, I guess. Um, but who who made it? And who grew the cacao that's being used in that? And so um, it's almost like cacao, you know, chocolate magically comes into, into being. And, <laughs> and here it is. Um, and so one company, and this is, they're in Missouri. We should have a road trip. Um, Let's see. Let me find collaboration bars. I think this is the one. Oh, we actually, sorry. That image there had it. See here? Who is that? Are these models? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're cuz these come from particular farms. So these are the farmers on the farm, on the front of the bar. How much like product is in that? Do you know like hmm? that or something? How much what? Like how much product is in that? It's like almost one of the 62%, it'll have different percentages. Is, is that what you mean? Are you paying $9 for a That's a bar, right? Yeah, it's probably. Yeah. Like the smaller, she's actually very generous with the size of her bars. But you can also ask what, what percentage mm -hmm. is going back to that guy and the people on that farm. It's a much larger percentage. And, a lot, and some companies have these transparency reports where you can see how much they're getting paid. And you look at the same statistics for other industri for industrial chocolate makers and there's no, there's no comparison. Okay, so I have clean hands. I wash my hands right before class. I'm going to break this up, and um, and y'all taste.
this is so this is liquor. This is like this is a hundred and ten percent because it's got the nib and it There's just no cacao. There's no sugar whatsoever. And this is Ecuadorian chocolate uh, cacao. <laughs> Is this chocolate bar going to be like really bitter? It's 110%. It's 110%. No. Yeah, yeah, basically this has been, it's been conched, it's been, um, it's been ground, it's been conched, it's been tempered. So it's gone through all of that, and then she put back in as her only inclusion the nibs from those same beans. So it's not even like a mixing across different. Also, like the chunks areas. on top, those are the actual nibs. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is in this like little. Her her factory is about a quarter the size of this room. It's amazing. But she's won international awards. I shouldn't buy you this way, but she's really nice. Okay, this time I'll start out on this. I should have a second pot. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. <laughs> my, my fingers. <laughs> yeah, just a little taste. It's potent. It's like so that Maya vessel that talked about the pure, unadulterated stuff. You get the taste of cacao, and that's it. Yeah. Now, is it entire? Now, what's your? What are the flavors you're tasting? I mean, I taste the chocolate, but it's, it's really, really bitter. Uh huh. That's yeah, um, yeah, it has a snap to it. So you could hear it snapping when I was. No, it just meant like it was. <laughs> and so at the. Yeah, go ahead. So, okay, so like you know how baker's chocolate is really bitter? Yeah. Is this like the same type of deal because they didn't add the sugar to it yet? Right. It has no sugar. And then. And then the bitterness, so bitterness also has to do with all those other steps I was talking about. The fermenting, the roasting. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take a little piece. When they sell, now who? What other, are you tasting other flavors besides bitter? I don't know. I really it's just like strong, yeah. The nib on top tastes the beef. Or the beef. It's like dirt. The nib on top tastes the beef. Yeah, then, then, right. And so you can think about the effects, right, the, so what is it? What about the texture? I mean, it's got the nib in there, so it's got that. Yeah. I think it's actually pretty dry. Uh-huh. Dry is actually correct because it's, you know, it depends on how much cocoa butter there is in it, how that sort of... Yeah. If it had sugar, it doesn't have any sugar. So, did anyone taste any sweet whatsoever? No. no. Right at the very beginning, there was maybe just like a little bit, but then it just yeah, and then it then it builds, and, and so that's one thing that you'll see like uh, with some of these. Uh, some chocolate that it's like some other foods that, that the longer it's in your mouth the different tastes that come out and that's part of what these uh, chocolate makers are playing with whereas uh, industrial chocolate they're just wanting it to be predictable and kind of actually not to be like oh wow but like hey yeah here you know here's a Snickers and I can eat it I'm getting the end and it's gonna it's gonna be very 
No, there's not a strong, that's what I was talking about. In South America, there's not a strong uh, cacao seed eating tradition, like, ethnographically. Um, they, they just didn't use it much. They do more with the fruit, um, which is sweet. Um, Did it, did it make all the way around? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.